Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and through our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, fellow redeemed. There are two verses that I want to highlight from the one from the Old Testament lesson that was read today and the other from the Gospel lesson that was read today. Both speak the word of blessing. They recognize and rejoice over the blessings we have received. And uh, the first verse that we're going to concentrate on is from Psalm 33, verse 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And then the second verse that we want to focus on is from our Lord's Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for those, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In the name of Christ Jesus, fellow redeemed, we hold dual citizenship, two citizenships. We are citizens of the United States of America, and we are subjects in the kingdom of God. And as such, we are doubly blessed by God. God's word tells us, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. You can learn a lot about a nation when you examine some of its public words, either on statues or monuments or in speeches by leaders. Listen now to some of those words from our young nation's birth and adolescence. July 4, 1776, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The opening words to the Declaration of Independence. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Approximately a hundred years later, 1886, New York Harbor, words on the Statue of Liberty. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to be breathed free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. November 19, 1863, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. President Abraham Lincoln. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, 
we cannot hollow or hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggle, struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that those dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. 1913, a poem by Catherine Lee Bates. O oh, beautiful, for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, for purple mountain majesties above the fruited plain. America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. O oh, beautiful, for pilgrim feet whose stern impassioned stress a thoroughfare for freedom beat across the wilderness. America, America, God mend thy every flaw. Confirm thy soul in self-control, thy liberty in law. January 1933, the Great Depression. President Franklin D. Roosevelt. This great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive and will prosper. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. January 1961 part of the inauguration addressed by President John F. Kennedy. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. August 1963, Civil Rights March on Washington, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. I say to you today, my friends, though even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up, live out the true meaning of its creed, which is, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. Are we a perfect nation? No, like many other nations, we regret mistakes we have made along life's way and we continue to make along the way of history. Have we as a nation always honored God in all of our thoughts, words, and deeds? I believe we must honestly answer no. We are a democracy governed by people, that is, sinful human beings. We are not a theocracy a government ruled and controlled by God. Are we, as a nation then, blessed by Almighty God, even though we have all these flaws? I think we would all answer that question with a resounding yes. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. So we honor and celebrate as a nation on this national birthday our blessings with praise and thanksgiving, just as we sang a few moments ago. 
And yet, as dearly as we love this country, and either personally or have loved ones who have sacrificed life and limb on battlefields everywhere, we have to acknowledge that the United States of America and every other nation and tribe of people in the world will not last forever. All earthly governments made up of sinful human beings will someday perish, for the wages of sin is death. But thanks be to God, we have another citizenship, one that does last forever. We have been given the gift of faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. We are subject to the love and rule of the one true God who so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Therefore, we are subjects of the kingdom of God, here and now and hereafter in eternity. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And who exactly are these poor in spirit? Jesus offered this teaching on the subject. Luke chapter 18. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God have mercy upon me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Much like citizens of a nation governed by the principles of democracy exercise their citizenship through the act of voting as indeed we shall be doing in November of this election year in a similar manner those who are subjects in the kingdom of God form churches which gather regularly around God's word and sacraments just as we are doing at this very time through the sacrament of holy baptism we are born anew into the kingdom of God. When Jesus met with the Pharisees, Nicodemus at night, for the purpose of instructing him in the Christian faith, he declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. And unlike the nations of the world which will perish someday, the kingdom of God lives on forever. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for you 
for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Every time we come to the communion table, we celebrate the fact that this means of grace is but a foretaste of the feast to come. Matthew chapter 26. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and offered it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. There was a young woman who had been diagnosed with a terminal illness and had been given three months to live. So as she was getting her things in order, she contacted her pastor and had him come to her house to discuss certain aspects of her final wishes. She told him which song she wanted sung at the service, what scriptures she would like read, and what outfit she wanted to be buried in. Everything was in order, and the pastor was preparing to leave when the young woman suddenly remembered something very important to her. There is one more thing, she said excitedly. What's that? the pastor asked. This is very important, the young woman continued. I want to be buried with a fork in my right hand. The pastor stood looking at the young woman, not knowing quite what to say. That surprises you, doesn't it? she asked. Well, to be honest, I'm puzzled by your request, the pastor replied. The young woman explained, My grandmother once told me this story, and from there on out I have always done so. I have also always tried to pass along its message to those I love and those who are in need of encouragement. In all my years of attending church socials and potluck dinners, I always remember that when the dishes of the main course were being cleared, someone would inevitably lean over and say, keep your fork. It was my favorite part because I knew that something better was coming, like a velvety chocolate cake or deep dish apple pie, something wonderful and with substance. So I just want people to see me there in the casket with a fork in my hand, and I want them to wonder what's with the fork. Then I want you to tell them, keep your fork. The best is yet to come. The pastor's eyes welled up with tears. Tears of joy as he hung, hugged the young woman goodbye. He knew this would be one of the last times he would see her before her death. But he also knew that the young woman had a better grasp of uh, what heaven would be like than many people twice her age with twice as much experience and knowledge. She knew that something better was coming. At the funeral, people were walking by the young woman's casket and they saw the pretty dress she was wearing and the fork placed in her right hand. Over and over, the pastor heard the question, what, what, what's with the fork? And over and over, he simply smiled. During his message, the pastor told the people of the conversation he had with the young woman shortly before she died. He also told them about the fork and about what it symbolized to her. The pastor told the people how he could not could stop thinking about the fork and told them that they probably would not be able to stop thinking about it either. He was right. So, the next time you reach down for your fork, let it remind you ever so gently that the best is yet to come. Amen.
May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to rise and join me in the words of the Apostles' Creed. You'll find them printed in the order of worship. 